Hello, everybody. So continuing our study of computer science, we lay the groundwork for what computers are. Now we moved on to data processing. So last week we talked about digits and the digital revolution. So now we're going to talk about data processing, which was the early days of the digital revolution. So first of all, what is data processing? Data processing is an application of the input processing output cycle. What is this? This is where data is input. It's either collected uh, by a human recorder or an electronic sensor. The data that has been input is then processed and analyzed according to the desired algorithms. The output is then the results of the algorithm that are displayed to a screen or that are printed. This uh, uh, data processing is a vital activity in the areas of business, medicine, and research, where you have a lot of data and you're uh, doing what is essentially crunching the numbers and trying to uh, glean some sort of meaning from that data. The uh, data processing characterized the first era of computational history, which was the 1940s to the 1970s. This is where digital computers shone, because before that time, before the 1940s, and um, com computations had to be uh, performed by teams of, wait for it, human computers. So it was an actual term for a, for a human where you had to take in large amounts of data, per, per, uh, perform some sort of computation on that data, and then publish or, or then give the results to the next team. So in fact, uh, it, it harkens back, um, if you're familiar with the with the Dune series uh, by Frank Herbert, then uh, there's a class in there, uh, a class of humans in there called Mentats, Mentats, and they their job w was essentially that of a human computer, so a sci-fi equivalent, just a, a, a little factoid. So that's data processing. What sort of digital computers were used uh, in data processing? They, uh, these were computers that were first developed during World War II, primarily for military use, um, th and then they found their way into the business and private sectors. These computers were massive and expensive, uh, usually because the electronic components, they hadn't, they hadn't been scaled down to the point where they are now. We're going to talk a, a, a little bit later about microchips and uh, and uh, just the the different elements, uh, the different electronic elements that really shrunk down in size, which allowed them to fit into essentially your your smartphone. This time, though, they were massive. They would take up whole rooms uh, just just for the electrical components. They were very expensive, both to create and also to maintain. Therefore, these computers were only acquired by governments, large corporations, by, and research facilities. The data uh, on these computers was stored on magnetic tapes, uh, very similar to cassette tapes. To, um, you know, within the last twenty years, or that, that were used until about a twenty uh, until about twenty years ago. So, some sort of cellophane or flexible material that had a metallic substance uh, um, printed on on top of that, or laid on top of that, that you could then set the magnetic charge, so it could be then read by the machine. The computers had to be operated by trained technicians. Once again, massive, expensive, and difficult to work with, comparatively speaking. The computers at this time were often very specific in function and use. You didn't have the ability to go in there and play a game of solitaire. Uh, if you wanted to look at the results of, of a blast experiment, great. If you wanted to look at seismic activity, fantastic. If you wanted to try and make a prediction about the markets, you might have better luck with a crystal ball, but okay, it could still be done by a computer. Anyway, that was a joke. All right, so these computers at that time were headless. Uh, and in fact, computers today, you still have headless computers uh, in the form of servers or even online games, online gaming, where uh, the computations and the world are held in 
on another computer and then it's then it's then displayed to a personal computer and it receives input from the computer so so I believe in that application, there's a little bit of sharing of computation. So it's not true. It's not true display at this time, because in a true headless computer, the computations are not done on the personal computer. So interaction occurred via a secondary connection using the keyboard and terminal displays. On these computers, you would perform centralized computing. This is where all the data is held and processed by the main computer, but data is entered and displayed from multiple terminal connections. It could be one or it could be a thousand, as many as the system allows. Data display, printing, and storage were connected via cables to the main computer. So data display were the terminals, printing and storage. This is where data was, it could either be sent to um, a physical printer, uh, you know, to print it on paper, or, um, or it could then be sent to another storage medium. The computers, okay, and we see here that centralized computing was the primary technology model during the early years of computation. Why was why was it? Why was centralized computing the primary technology model? Ah, it all gets back to money, and money uh, therefore limited public accessibility. But money was not the only reason. As we see here, the factors include the size of the computer. You couldn't have one of these babies sitting in your, in your living room. Uh, first of all, it's probably bigger than your living room. Uh, and then you have the terminal interface. We're very visual creatures. We don't, we don't like working with text any more than we have to. And so when you have a terminal where all you can do is simply enter data in the form of words, that's already limiting the number of people that such a task appeals to. And the second, uh, the second factor is data entry. So not only is it textual, but you also had data entry in the form of punch cards. Well, that limits your ability to work with these computers because you have to have a punch card maker. You have to make them yourself, or you have to have a punch card maker. And then you have to have a punch card reader, which then sends the data to the computer to form the calculations. So it's already very difficult. The last reason for why these computers had limited public accessibility and also limited public interest was that they were specialized. They could only perform very specific functions and software could only be loaded into the computer uh, at, 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 at an extreme cost of time and energy. It was not a general, you know, a, a general installation process. You couldn't go to Google dot com and pull up a website download the application run through the installation and boom less than five minutes you have an entire who knows what LibreOffice suite on your computer which is mind-blowing now when you think about it compared to what these guys were having to work with at this time so those are the main reasons why uh, the computers ha had limited public accessibility size the interface specialization, and uh, uh, finally, monetary. You couldn't afford these computers. So anyway, that uh, concludes this video on, uh, it's our second video on computer science, uh, introduction to computer science, and that was data processing. So what is it? It's the input processing and output cycle and the computers that were used at that um, and the computers that were used at that time very big um, very clunky <laughs> uh, very expensive and uh, therefore they had only um, only uh, uh, specific use cases very powerful in their applications don't get me wrong what they were what what they were making up for in their size and their cost they were saving money. Otherwise, the uh, otherwise the corporations and governments wouldn't use them. So there is a, there is that to take into consideration. Anyway, hope this video was informative. Uh, if you have any questions, just 
uh, put them down in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.